I'm getting echo here. You can fix that for me. There is a list of, or there's a stack at the back of the envelopes. So we're just going to hand one out to all of you that are here today, and we'll keep the rest of them back there. So we go back there and grab, you get your shoes off. I, I, I thought that was Jason, but now I realize that was you. Yeah. <laughs> just thinking like that. Okay. Um, should you look for envelopes? Yeah. Like these ones. Oh, maybe the other guys in here too. What? These are the ones I was going to hand out. Oh. Sorry, my bad. All right, just hand it. If, Ellie, if you'll help her, you just hand those out to everybody, the people that are here, and we'll leave the rest of them back there because I know there's a bunch of other people here wanting to invest in that. And then maybe Kayla, can I get you to come up here and just take? I think most people put their offering in, but just get whatever's left. If anybody wants to, uh, you know, something specifically for the best, right on there. Uh, so you guys are leaving May 5th. Yeah, this one I'm trying. May 5th. Okay. Well, we'll take up an offering today. The next Sunday we should have most people back to take up another offering and try to uh, get that to you before you leave. Now we're just going to make a commitment to them. Uh, we're, just, we're still kind of praying about what the number is that we're going to commit. And we're, they're probably raised every week that we're just going to say the church is going to give so much and we're going to hit you guys up every week to throw a little extra into the for them. And then we'll somehow, I guess, do PayPal or something. Probably PayPal. We'll get it to until they have instant access in the morning. So be praying for it. I, I just honor and respect them for... You know, it's one thing to say, yeah, we're going to do whatever Jesus wants to do, that, but that means sometimes he tells you to sell your house, quit your job, sell everything you own, and go to Brazil and don't even know where your house is at and all those things. It, 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 it's easy on the face value, but the reality of it is if you're in the middle of it, it's probably not so exciting at first. So, all right. You guys awake? Glory. It's 12.30. I got you guys for two more hours, so. All right, we're going to continue in our series on uh, in Revelations. Revelation. Uh, I've had a lot of questions about what we've been teaching. And, you know, I, these books, these letters to these churches have been used for so long to beat up people in the beat up God's people. They've been using Jesus' words for so long to beat people up that when somebody comes in and says, hey, wait a minute, that doesn't reconcile with the full gospel. You can't take these words out and use them to beat people up when Jesus himself says, I didn't come to condemn the world but save it. And so now we're presenting it in a light of grace of the finished work, and a lot of people are having a hard time with it, and that's good. I don't mind the questions. I want to ask questions all the time. I want, the, I want people to understand this. And I'm thinking about going into Jesus' teaching as my next, uh, because I don't know how many times people say, you know, use Jesus' words to beat people up. How many pastors, how many churches, how many ministries take the words of Jesus and use them to beat people up? And the, the truth of it is you've got to understand, you've got to rightly divide the words, you've got to begin to see what Jesus was doing, who he was talking to, and that there was a transition coming forth, but... Jesus was not using those words so that I can come in here and beat you up with them. Amen? So we're going to look at it a little different. This will be my third one, my third church. And then Dustin knows where they'll be here next week. And so you get a little break and we'll go back into it. And we'll finish this series up. But I uh, uh, hope you've been blessed by it. Uh, a lot of people have been messaging me and texting me. And, uh, I mean, let me make one thing clear and then we'll move into this. Last week I said, I, I get the accusation that you don't preach the full gospel or the full counsel of God. And I said, hey, grace is the full counsel of God. And, and somebody had a hard time with that. So let me explain a little bit more detail. Maybe they'll watch this week and they'll hear, hear the full explanation. All through the Old Testament, it was pushing everything to the cross. Every sacrifice, every prophecy, everything that was happening was leading to the cross. And since we since the cross, the whole New Testament is pushing everything back to the cross. So Jesus is the full counsel of God. And if we believe that somewhere in there that there's a, a wrathful, mad God, or that we have a problem with sin that needs to be dealt with, then we look back to the cross because the full counsel, the Word was made flesh. 
That, that word made there was finished. It was God's final word in regards to humanity. And so when I say that grace is the full counsel of God, it's not saying that the gifts of the spirits are or, or, or any of these things. All these things are included, but they're all included because of grace. Amen? All right. Where do we start here? Where do I start on I'm going to go through these established truths one more time. We've been through them every week, and we will continue to go through them every week. Uh, John 3.17 is where we're going to... You don't have to go over your Bible search. I'm going to go through these really fast, and we're going to get into Revelations. But we want to establish the truth that if we read Scripture that's outside of this, then we, everything has to reconcile with these truths. So John 3.17 says, Why did Jesus come into the world? He didn't come into the world to condemn it. He came to save it. Uh, actually, Jesus said... What did Jesus say about what am I here for? He says, if you believe in me, this is John 5, 24. If you believe in me and the message I preach, you'll never be condemned. The New Living Translation says you'll never be condemned. You've already passed from death to life. You'll never be condemned to your sins. What was God doing in Christ? 2 Corinthians 5, 19 says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed us to the word of reconciliation. What did Jesus represent? 1 John 2, 2 says that he is a propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Romans 5, 9 is what, what happens to that purpose. propitiation is the atonement. Jesus was the, the atonement for sin, not even for the believer, but for the unbeliever. And the whole world was included in forgiveness on the cross. Romans 5, 9 says that we have been justified by his blood and will be saved from wrath through him. 1 Corinthians 6.11 says that some of you, this is, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So not only were he, was he the propitiation, not only did he save us from wrath, but he literally justified us and sanctified us and made us into a new creation. That we're no longer the same thing that we were before, but we're, the word new there is kainos, and that we're literally, and the word kainos there means a substance of better quality. He literally changed your DNA and transforms you into something completely different than what you were before. And what covenant, this is the seventh of the fill, what covenant are we in now? Hebrews 8, 10 through 12 says, For this is the covenant that I will make of the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law on their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, none of his brothers, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest. I will be merciful to their righteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In the new covenant, God does it whole or He's not imputing our sins to us. He's not, he, God is not relating to us based on our behavior. But in the new covenant, God is based on, is relating to us based on Jesus. Okay. So, we can't, those things are all true. And so we cannot get to Revelation and begin to say that now Jesus is punishing us for our mistakes. Or, or Jesus is coming back as the, the lion that's going to punish us. Because, because he never changes. So it's the same God today, yesterday, today, and forever. So when we read scripture that seems like Jesus is now punishes for our sins, we've got to know that it doesn't fit in the full counsel of God of grace. So here we go. We're going to start at verse 18. And I'll try to slow down a little bit because this, when I read this to you, it's not going to sound very graceful. Uh, it says, And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write. So... Uh, a lot of you have been following the series, but the, the word angel there is messenger, and I think it should have been translated into pastor. It's the messenger of this church. Uh, uh, the Young's literal translation translation actually translated as messenger. So unto the messenger of the church of Thyatira, the reason I say pastor is because if it was to say to the messenger of the church of God's glory tabernacle, it would be talking to me, right? So to the, to the letter, first off, before we get started, is written... To a pastor of a church. It's not written to the congregation. Okay. What, hey James, can you adjust this or do something with it? Yeah, we, we're getting that. We're trying. I'm, I'm overworking work, him to death back there. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Here we go. Uh, write these things. These things says the Son of God who had eye, his eyes like into a flame of fire and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Now withstanding, I have a few things. 
I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest the woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to her idols. And I give her space to repent of her fortification, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, all the churches shall know that I am He, which searches the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But I say, but unto you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you no other burden. But that which, which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he who over he that overcometh and keepeth my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter, and they shall be broken to shivers, even as I received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Sounds pretty good news, huh? Okay. Let's break into this a little bit. Let's go through this today. And uh, first off, I think every if it's a theologian would agree with me, whether they're legalistic, grace minded, it doesn't matter, that Revelation is a book full of symbology. That Jesus uh, he talks about you know the seven beasts and the seven heads, and he's not literally talking about seven beasts, he's talking about seven nations. Okay? Uh, all throughout Revelation there's symbology being used, and it's being used here. <laughs> You know what's funny is, is I think there, you might, I might be wrong, I think it's like two or three chapters on Jezebel in the Bible, and I bet there's more writ, books written about Jezebel than there is about, about anything else. If you go online and look at Jezebel, uh, you're going to find tons of information about Jezebel, and there's only, literally, there's, there's like two chapters, maybe two and a half chapters written on Jezebel. Actually, a lot of the doctrine that maybe many of you came up in in the charismatic church that says, you know, don't wear uh, makeup, don't cut your hair, don't look pretty, right? It's because of Jezebel, because she actually, it says she dressed herself up right before she died and she fell off the building. And so a lot of people, that's why they would, you know, Judy said that you know, when she was in uh, charismatic circles that a lady came in one day and had her nails painted and she looks over to her friend and says, ah, she's going to hell, that little Jezebel. <laughs> And so we laugh at that now, but in reality, that was the doctrine of the church just in the 90s. And maybe there's still churches today that believe that way, that go that way. And then there's a lot of writings about the spirit of Jezebel, right? And that's what most people talk about, the spirit of the vision and these things. But in this, in this very instance right here, we know that he's not talking about Jezebel herself because she's already dead, obviously. But if you look at verse 24... He says, But I say unto you, and unto the rest of thy attire, as many as have not this doctrine. So what is he talking about? He's talking about the doctrine of Jezebel that's in the church. And he's writing to the pastor. He's not writing to the congregation and getting on to them because of the, doctrine of Je the doctrine of Jezebel. He's literally writing to the pastor about allowing this doctrine of Jezebel to be in the church. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to start back at verse 18, and we're going to go through this verse by verse. Uh, Under the angel of the church of Thyatira, write these things, the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. So this is a good church. Right? It says, I know your faith. This is a church of faith. He says, I know your love. Charity is love. He says, I know your patience. And he actually says, I know your works twice. He says, I know your works to start out with. And you finish up, I know your works. And he says that your last works are greater than your first works. So this is a, what we would say is a pretty good Christian church. But then he goes in verse 20. He says, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophet, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication and to eat things, Sacrifice unto idols. Idols. So, if, I don't know if you're familiar with Jezebel. Most of you are. The real story of Jezebel. How she was uh, uh, a self-proclaimed prophetess of the god Baal. The false god Baal. And that she's... Uh, 
she was she claimed to speak for God, right? She claimed to speak for God. But what? So what is the doctrine of Jezebel? She actually spoke a false understanding of God. She revealed what's the doctrine? The doctrine. If you look it up, they're going to say it's about sexual immorality and all these things here, and we'll go into that in just a minute. But the doctrine of Jezebel is about revealing God falsely. Revealing God to the church falsely. I hate to say it, but Jezebel is not only tolerated in most churches in the United States or maybe the world, but Jezebel is celebrated in most churches. Amen. A false understanding of God is, is actually celebrated. What you do for God, how you, if you want, let me get ahead of my message. Let me just back up here because I'm going to get it. <laughs> the word fornication, it, a lot of your Bibles might use uh, sexual immorality. The word, the word literally is to practice idolatry. That's what it means. It's not, it's not just a, I'm not saying it can't be used for that. But you know, Jesus actually said to the, the Pharisees, he says, you are a wicked and adulterous generation. This is the Pharisees. These are your good boys and girls. These are the high. These are the people that that most people look up to in church. And these are law-abiding Christians. And he calls them adulterous generation. Why is that? It's not because that they're out actually sleeping with other women other than their wives. They they are actually teaching God's people to be intimate with tablets of stone versus being intimate with a living God. Why do I say that most churches today celebrate Jezebel? Because most churches today teach people to be intimate with some rules and regulations on how to become right with God versus being intimate with God. Amen. I want to establish Romans. I want to establish adultery real quick, how the Bible presents adultery, and we'll go back into this real quick. Uh, Romans 7, 1 through 4 and it says, Do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, and you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Adultery in the Bible is not, I'm not saying that it can't be me cheating on my wife, or that, I'm not saying that that's not a right definition, but in God's eyes, if you were under the law, you could not step into another covenant, because you'd be in two covenants, you'd be in, you would be considered to be an adulterer. This is what Paul's writing here. And so what does he say? He says that you have, he says that because you have died to the law, now you can marry into this covenant. But what the problem is, is we, the church for so long now, has been in this covenant with Christ, but we keep wanting to go back to this covenant over here and actually be committing adultery against Christ. We're actually trying to live in two covenants, and it's only, it's only the tree of life or the tree of the, of, of the, right and wrong. It's the only two trees you get to choose from. If you're living in both trees, you're actually committing adultery on Christ. So what do we know of Jezebel? She's a false prophet. She's teaching people to be intimate with, intimate with the false god. A god that says, you do and I do. Let's go, what, uh, he, she says, it says that he, she teaches them to eat things, sacrifice to idols. What verse is that? Verse 20 said, I have this against you that you thou sufferest up Jezebel, which calls yourself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fortification and to eat things sacrificed to idols. So what does this mean? Are they are they eating uh, animals that were sacrificed to Baal? No, I don't believe so. I believe that this I believe they were nourished and built up on their own doing to get God's attention. You see. We teach in the church that your sacrifice is what you do to get God to move on your behalf. If you need God to really move on your behalf, you do more. If you need God to do something for you, the bigger the need, the bigger the sacrifice. 
If we need, if you need a financial breakthrough, you give more money. If you need to, if the devil's attacking your family, you pray harder. You pray longer. If 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 if, if your mind's being cluttered with stuff, you need to read the Bible more. That your sacrifice somehow is going to get God to move on your behalf. That you're being nourished and built up on your doing instead of His doing. You see, that's why most people find faith in their sacrifice. Hope in their sacrifice. You know how many people have told me that I know God's going to give me a breakthrough because I sowed, I sowed a seed this week. God's going to do this because I did that. God's going to do this. What are they doing? They're beginning to put their faith and their hope in what they are doing. And what they are doing becomes their idol. We have never been called to put my faith in my giving. My, let me say this real quick. I'm not against reading our Bible. I'm not against praying. I believe that those things should be... If you're intimate with a living God, you're going to read your Bible, you're going to pray, and you're going to be a giver, you're going to be generous. If, if all those things... That comes from being intimate with God. But, what, but the wrong thinking is, is that God's not moving on my behalf because I haven't done something. This is the doctrine of Jezebel. That, that you are actually... It doesn't say sacrificing foods either. It says that you are sacrificing, that you eat things sacrificed to idols. That you're nourished on things sacrificed to, to your doing. Right? If you, have, if you believe you have to do something to get God to move on your behalf, move on your behalf, you're putting your hope in an idol. And according to the Bible, this is adultery. Because the Word says that all promises are yes and amen in Him. And Ephesians 1 3 says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. There's nothing, He's given you everything. People put, we, we, we put our, we make our source our job, we make our source our, our ability to, to uh, make money, we make our source on my ability to do it all, I make my, the source on, on, our, our, you know, on having a good worship team and our ability to play good music. But the truth of it is our source has to be Him and if it's not Him, then we're literally beginning to be nourished and built up on things that have been sacrificed to idols. We're beginning to be nourished on my doing. You know, I'm not against the intercessory ministry, but we spend we'll spend a lot of time praying and praying and praying and praying for breakthrough, and a lot of times we don't see it because we're praying for things that all promise are yes and amen in Him. We're asking God to do things on our behalf that He's already done, He's already given us. And so what happens is we no longer get the the, the Bible says that when He answers our prayer, we'll have fullness of joy. We no longer get that fullness of joy manifesting in our life anymore. We are now satisfied with our idol, and it's our praying. We're, sat we're satisfied with our doing. Adding anything to Jesus is an adultery to the sacrifice that he has made. Let's go to verse 21. And I gave her space to repent of her fortification, she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except that they repent of her deeds. So Jesus already said in, in, in the Gospels that if you don't believe, if you don't fully believe, if you don't fully receive everything I have to offer to you, you are condemned already. There, there's, if you're still putting your hope in your doing and your ability, you're condemned already. There's Christians that are condemned in this church right now, maybe not today, but there's Christians that are condemned in this church because they still are putting their hope and their ability and their doing and they, they're sacrificing and they believe that their sacrifice is causing God to move on their behalf and they have never entered the fullness of joy they've never entered the fullness of peace and what Jesus is saying here to the ministry of Jezebel I will put, I will put her in a bed he's saying that she will be sickly that she will be without power verse 23 I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he that searches the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. So you, you got to reconcile these words, and I will, I will kill her children with the words that Jesus says that let the little children come to me. Right? This is sim, this is symbolic, symbol language. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but he, he's ta he's talking about a doctor Jezebel and her children. And basically, it's the ministry that are birthed out of 
out of you do to get God. The, 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 the ministries that are birthed birth out of mixing grace with law, the, 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 it's all been provided, but you have to sacrifice. These ministries that have been birthed out of that, Jesus is saying that I'm going to kill these things. I'm going to put an end to them. We talked about this in the very first church where he says, I'll remove the lampstand. Sometimes some ministries needed to be shut down. If they are bringing condemnation and they're not setting God's people into freedom and they're not allowing God's people to lead them into a place of intimacy, if they're not pointing the congregation to Jesus Christ, they need to just be shut down. They just need to be ended with, done with, over with. Because Christ made too big of a sacrifice for us to think that our sacrifice is somehow going to move God uh, in our behalf. The truth of it is, is these ministries, I don't care how long they've been out, they have no power to transform lives. They only have power to behavior modification through the law. I'll, 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 use, I'll use, Scott's not here today, I'll use Paul. Paul just shared this morning that, that when he came here, he began to receive God's grace and God's love for him, that he, it, God took this black heart that could know, that didn't even know how to love, didn't even know what, what love was, and it transformed it into a heart that now, when he says, I love you to his kids or his wife or whatever, he understands what that means. These ministries that are being led by Jezebel, people might be, they might have the best givers in town. They might have dedicated workers in their church, but they don't have people that have been transformed or been changed. They're the same, they're just, what, what happens is they just become, this, they're the same miserable dead person inside, now they're just a hypocritical miserable dead person inside. This is what Jesus is talking about, I'm going to put them in a sick bed. They're, they're, I'm not going, I'm not going to allow, that those ministries will have no power to transform lives. It's because it's only the finished work of the cross that's going to transform your life, it's going to change, it's only the love of God that's going to, that's going to take this dead heart, this heart of stone, and actually make it a, a heart of flesh. The ministries birthed from Jezebel are sickly and they are divided. Verse 24. But I say unto you, but I say, and unto the rest of dire tire as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put on you no other burden, but that which you have already held fast till I come. Verse 26. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, I will give power over the nations. This word keepeth here. And the Greek actually means to guard from loss. So here's what it says. And he that overcometh, overcometh what? The doctrine of Jezebel. He that overcometh the doctrine of Jezebel and guard from loss of my works until the end. It's plain English. Not your works. And guard from loss his works until the end. I will give power over the nations. Verse 27. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter. They shall be broken into shivers, even as I received from my father. So listen, the rod of iron is not for you. The, order, the rod of iron is not for people. The rod of iron is for nations. That's what he says. He says, I'll give you power over the nations and a rod of iron. Right? Let's talk about, how does he describe the nations? He describes them as, as vessels of potter. And so, if you can imagine the United States as a vessel of potter, it just contains everything that's inside of it. So who is inside of it? We're inside of it. Right? We are the we are what's inside the vessel, but the nation itself, I'm an American, you're American, we're what's inside this pottery, right? But Jesus says that I will give them a rod of iron as the vessel of part that shall be broken into ships. What's Jesus saying? He's saying that when we begin to understand that, that there's no more Greek, there's no more Jew, but that we're all one in Christ, that there's no more Mexican, there's no more United States, there's no more Canada, there, that we're all one in Christ, that those who have that, those who get that revelation, those who can overcome this doctrine of Jezebel and begin to realize it's not about my doing, but it's about his doing, and because of that, I can no longer uh, look at my brother in Mexico as something separate than me. I can only look at my brother. What's he saying? He says, I will give you a rod to bust down these, to break down this pottery, to break down these vessels. And it, as they begin to break, as, as a vessel breaks, everything inside of it begins to run together. And then we literally begin to have a revelation that we're in unity. This is why it drives me crazy when people come against us. We're helping out the people in other nations. 
as if God sees Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Haiti, Mexico, Brazil, anything different. That he's got these same border lines that he put up and that he said, help those in your community and nobody else. When we begin to get the revelation that we are all one in Christ, then I can no longer, that gives me the ability to begin to break this pottery, begin to let these things flow, and then we can begin to come into unity. You know, I, when I first came with the finished work message, I, in my heart of hearts, I thought that this was the message that was going to bring the church out of division and bring it into unity because it didn't matter. If you agree with speaking in tongues, if you disagree with speaking in tongues, it didn't matter because what did the finished work message do? It brought it all back to where it should have been with that the whole time and brought it back to Jesus. Amen. Right? And so as we are Christians, with God, if we are in His kingdom, and His kingdom isn't divided and separated like this kingdom. Right? And it's, my thought was every man-made definition, every denomination, and all these things are going to crumble at the finished work of Jesus Christ because we're going to begin to see that it was never about Baptist, Pentecostal, full gospel. It was never about any of these things. It was always about there's no Greek and there's no Jew, but we're all one in Christ. There's no male, there's no female, we're all one in Christ. So we can begin to get rid of all of our sexist ideas. We can get rid of all of our division ideas and we can all come back into one unity in Jesus. And this is what Jesus is telling you. He's telling you that when you get past see because, because if it's about my doing then in my church and I'm talking about this church then, then we've got our list of our doing and maybe, maybe the Baptist church has a different list of their doing and we don't want nothing to do with them because they're not, they don't agree with us. And we say the, the ministry of Jezebel keeps us divided. It keeps us doing. It keeps us in a false identity of who God is. And we never come into the fullness of what God has to offer us. Let's go on here real quick. He says in 28, I will give him. Now I want you to get this real quick. I've said this every week. We, religion loves to put off every blessing into some, some place in the future far out there. That when you die and the by and by you're going to get all these blessings. But the gospel doesn't do that. Jesus isn't saying, well, if you overcome in the end, I'll give you a rod of iron. Jesus is saying, if you overcome today this bad teaching, you begin to get your identity of Christ in me, the hope of glory. If you begin this today, I'll give you that rod of iron right now. You can walk out of this church with that rod of iron in your hand. Just like last week, we talked about the hidden manna. If you overcome today, you get, you get to partake of the hidden manna now. You get to receive of the white stone right now. It's not something that we're going to push off to some other time, some other place. When, when things get better. It, it, no, it's now. It's our right thinking now. Uh, Romans, I believe Romans 12, 2 says that God allow God to transform you by the renewing of your mind. It's when we, the transformation comes when we need to think right thoughts about God. As long as I continue, you know, I had, again, I've had, I, I've answered this question a million times about repentance. Brother Bill doesn't believe you have to repent. Brother Bill doesn't believe you have to confess. That is not true. And I'm going to lay it out again. Though I just don't believe in the church's teaching on repentance. The actual word repentance is comes from the Catholic Church and it means to pay again. You know when the Catholic, you would be saved and then if you sin one time you're allowed to pay penance for your sin. But the problem was is after you paid penance if you sinned again there wasn't another, uh, another option to be set free from sin or to be saved. And so the Catholic Church came up with repentance, right? And so the, so the Protestants come in, we separate from the Catholic Church, and we start teaching a more of a grace-minded, you don't have to worship Mary, you don't have to do these things, it's not about those things. But we, can, we carry the same idea of repentance, that it is my sacrifice to God to get God to move on my behalf. It is my crying at the altar that gets God to forgive me. It is my turning away from these things. And I... I absolutely agree with repentance, but I don't agree with that because I looked the word up in the Greek. You can look it up. You can go home and look it up on your Bible. You can go and look it up right now. The word is metanoia, and it means to change the way you think. Well, Brother Peter said that repent and you'll get forgiven of your sins. He's talking to Jews. That's too. He's talking to Jews that are there to sacrifice animals for the forgiveness of sins, and he just preaches to them about Jesus, and they say, what must we do? Change the way you think. 
Come into covenant with Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Amen. Not you need to turn from sin and then God will forgive you. That doesn't work that way. Then all, none of us should have came to the cross because I bet none of us completely turned from sin when we were saved. Maybe we had some good intentions, but our good intentions fell short probably the next day, maybe the next hour after we walked out of the church. Repentance doesn't get God to forgive you. Jesus on the cross got God to forgive you. Confession does not get God to forgive you. Can Jesus on the cross is why you are forgiven. Well, brother, so you don't believe in confession. No, I think, it, I think in any healthy relationship with my wife, if I do something that would hurt her feelings, I would say to her, I'm sorry. But you see, Jezebel will teach you that your confession is what keeps you in right standing with God. Amen. That is absolutely, I'm, I'm not even going to first John one night, I've taught it a million times, I'll teach it a million more, but not today. But the truth of it is, is that my confession to God is because I'm in a relationship with Him, and if I do something to Him that are against Him that would hurt my Heavenly Father, I will say I'm sorry. But if you're under the Jezebel that I have to confess every sin, your confession is not any more heartfelt than talking to that table because you're just confessing to remain saved. You're not confessing because you don't know, because you think that, because you care what God thinks. It has nothing to do with that. Every night at your bed, Lord, forgive me if uh, I shouldn't have talked to Jimmy that way today and I shouldn't have done this. And Lord, you know all the other things I did wrong today. Thank you. I'm saved for the night. You know, if a tornado comes tonight, I've got to make it. Then tomorrow as I wake up, I go back and I never, I never really meant any of it. It never transformed me. It just was the checklist that Jezebel gave me so that I could continue to stay in right, right relationship with God. When in the whole time, Jesus on the cross was enough. His sacrifice was enough for me to stay in right relationship and here's what I think about repentance. I think you should be repenting all the time. I think you should be changing the way you think continually about God, about His creation, about His love, about His joy. And I think that if you truly are repenting, not... Listen, I do believe that repentance can be turned from sin. This is what it's, in this context, he said, repent of the Jezebel doctrine. Absolutely, you, you can repent and turn from sin, but repentance starts inside, and then the actions will manifest outside. And Jesus said that right to the Pharisees. He says, you clean up the cup, but you never, the inside remains dirty. He says, if you clean the inside up, the outside will automatically be clean. Right? Amen. So, repent of what you think. Jesus isn't promising you these things off in the by and by, and these are not for the future. I'm not saying all revelations are for the future. These seven churches right now are real seven churches that existed 2,000 years ago that had real pastors, real congregations, and these promises were made to them that we can take on ourselves because every promise in Him is yes and amen. It's not for tomorrow. It's not when you die. It's not when the rapture comes, whether it comes or not. It's not for any of those things. What it is for is if I can get past my stinking thinking about God, that He's going to give me a rod of iron and He's going to give me the morning star. You know what that morning star is? It's day star. It's the sun. Last week we talked about He's going to give you the hidden manna. It's when I can get past that doctrine of Balaam that says, that says that puts that puts that roadblock up, that stumbling block to keep me from the promises of God. If I can get past that stumbling block, those promises are made available right here, right now. They're mine for the taking. I can keep pushing them off. You know, I, I hate to do this because I have friends that believe this way, but I, you know, in 90 days you'll get your breakthrough. I can push it off for 90 days. I stopped going to church there because I wanted my 90 days to finally catch up so I could actually get my breakthrough because next week it was another 90 days and next week it was another 90 days and next week it was another 90 days and I thought, if I keep going to church, I'm never going to get it. And then one day I got a revelation that all promises are yes and amen right now. Amen. I don't have to wait 90 days. I can step into the fullness of what God has for me right now. I can take that rod of iron and I can begin to crush down every man-made denomination, everything that separates, every container that identifies you. You know the deal is, is those, those vessels, those pottery vessels, that, that's actually what we get our identity in. Is that thing, in God's glory tabernacle, we have a pottery vessel, if you will, using simple language, that we identify ourselves with what is taught in, in here. Right? 
We have it everywhere. We're, if you live in Missouri, you're a Missouri. You have a vessel that identifies. And Jesus says that we will take that rod of iron and we'll crush that down because our identity rests in Him and Him alone. Nothing else. He says, I'm going to give you the morning star right now today. 2 Peter 1.19. He's going to bring it up here. He says this. This is Peter. This is the only other place in the Bible that talks about a morning star. He says, And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Jesus says that if you can get past this doctrine of Jezebel, of your doing, your sacrifice, this false identity, this false image of God that is this taskmaster instead of the Father that I revealed to you. If you can get past that, he says, I'm going to, there's, there's going to be a, a light that comes in and it's going to illuminate your heart. And it's going to take that heart of stone. It's going to turn it into a heart of flesh. It's going to take that the wrong thinking you think about your neighbor and make it a of, of love because you because the morning star has risen in your heart and you have now revelation of the Father God who is love and because of that it literally changes you and transforms you. Mm -hmm. It's not for tomorrow. It's not for it's not for uh, when the next blood moon happens. It's for today. It's for right now. God wants He wants that that morning star. He wants that light to illuminate the dark places in your life right now, but as long as you adhere to a doctrine that says that you need to do more so you can be more, you are, there, Paul writes about that there's a veil that's over your face and every time that the law is read, you cannot see Christ and Him crucified because you're too busy with this veil over your face thinking that you need to do something to get right with God and if you believe that way, you're under Jezebel right now. You're under her spell right now. Get this, Ephesians 3, 17. So, he says, so Peter says that the morning star will be uh, will, will rise in your heart. 3.17 says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. The illuminate. I got I went all over the place. So. <laughs> I don't know where I put it at. I don't know if I put it in here. Listen, I, I, I've heard it said in the church many times. We, we need to get back to supernatural Christianity. We need to pray more. We need to, we need to be healing the sick. We need to do these things. And I agree with all that. I think we should be. I think the church should be operating in that stuff. So how do we do it? Paul writes to the, to the Galatians. He says uh, in, in, in the message, he says that uh, uh, you're crazy or you something like that. The New King James Version says you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has who has cast a spell over you? That he says, did you receive the Spirit by keeping of the law? Did you receive the Spirit by working out your own efforts? Did you receive the Spirit by your tearing and your begging and your pleading with God, or did you receive the Spirit by faith? He said, did you work signs and wonders and miracles by your fasting and your pressing in, or did you work working by faith? We're going to receive Christ, the fullness of everything He has to offer. I receive that, that morning star into my heart by faith that He loves me unconditionally, that I can fall a million times, and He's there's nothing we talked about this morning. The Bible said that nothing can separate me from the love of God, and it says nothing created and nothing in the spiritual realm. I can't even separate myself from the love of God. I can't even go far enough down to separate myself from the love of God. And when I really begin to believe that, and I really begin my blessings, that I'm blessed because of what Jesus did, and that my financial blessings, that my financial breakthrough, that everything is because of what Jesus did, that there's going to literally be a, a, a light, a revelation that's going to begin to birth in me, and, and I'm going to receive it by faith. And the truth of it is, if we haven't, if you're still in that, that I'm going to work, I'm going to work, I'm going to work, you haven't, the Bible says, you haven't been to understand the width, the depth, the length, the height of God's love, you've missed you missed the fullness of what he has to offer you. You see, Paul says, 
The, the mystery of the ages has been revealed to us right now. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. Righteousness, blessing, favor lives inside of you right now. It's not something that, that you're trying to attain. It is already present and dwelling inside of you. And I no longer live and Christ lives in me. You know, a lot of people don't see their breakthrough because they never step forward. You know, the bets. We, they're, they're here today. We ship them in. They, they could have sat around and waited until they got a house, until they got all their finances, until everything came into place. But the problem with that is that that's not faith. Faith doesn't sit around and wait. Faith takes the first step. Even though you don't know where the second step's going to land, you just take that step. And you take another step. And you take another step. Most people never see their financial breakthrough because they, and when they can preach faith, they can talk faith, they can talk trust, they can say we've got to have a relationship with Jesus, but they never have their breakthrough. They never come to a place of peace. They never come to a place of rest because when, it gets, when the rubber hits the road, they really don't have that type of trust. They don't really have a type of trust to make a commitment to certain things because if they make that commitment, that means that, that I'm not going to get my finances. I'm not going to get this. I'm not going to get that. You know, when we went to Russia, at $8,000 in Russia, I had approximately $500. I said, we're going to do this. Mary did a fundraiser for it. Other people stepped up. When I left, we had $8,000 to pay for everything. I got back. My business was slow. I, we were broke. Like, Carter had a graduation for his uh, boot camp. And I drove out there and had to borrow $1,500 from him so that I could get back home. That's how broke we were. But I knew that if God told me to go do that trip, that, he, that whatever, no matter what my circumstances were, that God was going to provide for us. And literally a month later, every bill was paid. I had Carter paid back off, and we were fine. Now, I could have sat at home and said, well, if God provides the money, I'll go. And I'd still be sitting here right now waiting on God to provide me the money to go. I could have said, well, I can't go to my son's graduation because i got to wait for God. If God's going to provide the money, I'll go. Then I would have missed my son's graduation. But God knew that that meant something to me, that it was important to me, and if it's important to me, it's important to him. And I just went by faith. And I literally, it was complete faith. I basically put it on a credit card. And if you know me, I don't like put anything on a credit card. But I went and I said, Lord, you're going to have to provide. The reason I don't have the money to go is because I went to Russia. Like I felt like you led me to do. If I missed you, I'm still trusting you to provide. I'll share this. This is not with my message. But, you know, we're so worried about missing God's call or God's will. Let me tell you something. If you're going to spend more time standing around worrying about missing it, then what you would do if you just step out in it. And if you miss it, God's gonna, he's not gonna, he didn't let Peter sink to the bottom of the ocean. He went out and picked him back up. So sometimes we step out of faith and say, I think this is God, I think this is God, and I miss it. And the truth of it is, even in my failure, even in my weakness, it's when Christ is strong. Amen. If God puts something on your heart, or you think this is what God wants me to do, don't wait for all the ducks to, in a row because he just doesn't work that way. He never has. It's always you move and I will be there to catch you every step. Hallelujah. I want to encourage you guys. Let's, I'd like to, I've only got a few left in here today. I think I'm bored everybody to do. Uh, I'd like to minister to these guys for the lead. So maybe, can you play some music, Kyle? Can I get, can I get you two to pray with us? Can I wake you late? Can you put your cover on you? Take it off, stay a while. Yeah, I'd like to all church too if we can get the best to come up here. And everybody just pray over them, prophesy over them, and just speak blessings into their life. Can we turn the lights down just a little bit? Hallelujah. Bobby, you come up here and, and pray with them.
Things that someone's gonna look at. Like. 